Good evening. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you two gentlemen from a company called Precise Automation. They do development of uh, collaborative robotics and manufacturing. Uh, Brian Powell, Mr. Brian Powell, and Mr. Darren Jacobs are going to make a presentation this evening. Uh, Mr. Powell spent over 25 years in the industry. Uh, his, uh, <coughs> one of his notable achievements was the development for a company of, called Xyrotex, uh, which is a division of Seagate, uh, developing factory floor automation for manufacturing of disk drives in, in some of the older PCs. Which, uh, which I so happen to have one. <laughs> um, he holds a BS degree in computer engineering and an MBA. Uh, Mr. Jacobs has joined uh, Precision Off Precise Automation recently, and he comes in through the service industry, <coughs> has over 30 years of experience in the industry, and one of his uh, big achievements was uh, development of uh, automation and welding practices for uh, uh, robotics for Harley-Davidson and uh, several of the automotive companies. Uh, Mr. J Mr. Jacobs holds a, uh, uh, a BS degree in business and management, sort of cum laude, and uh, so I get the floor to these two gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thanks for your Yeah, so I've got the easy job tonight. Um, I have to give a little excuse here. It, it was out of my hands, but I was going to bring R2-D2 with me, and it was going to move around, and and so we're just going to have to settle for some movies tonight because that got lost in shipping. So I think it was a robot that was doing the carrying, and so, so that didn't know didn't know how to find its way down here to Atlanta. So apologize for that, but in and uh, I, I promise you in any subsequent meetings that we would have again, uh, be happy to bring bring the robot next time, okay? So uh, I'm gonna, the bulk of the presentation is gonna be uh, my boss, uh, uh, Brian Powell here, okay? Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, if I may, it's always good to know your audience before you get started. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you in here have actually used a robot or even messed around with a robot before? Fantastic. Okay. Um, so what our company does is uh, a little bit different. As you can tell by the title, we do something called collaborative robots. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make this a sales pitch. Uh, in fact, uh, knowing who I was going to be speaking to tonight, I'm going to do my best to educate you. Um, now, you're welcome to ask questions. If uh, I'm unclear on something or if you uh, need a little bit more detail, feel free to stop me. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this should be a pretty free-flowing uh, presentation. Um, so without too much advertisement, I'd like to talk about our company background a little bit. It's always good to understand uh, you know, really how you fit into the, or how we fit into the robotics industry. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the, the robot industry. Um, I'm going to try and define for you what a collaborative robot is. How many people in here have actually heard of a collaborative robot and have a good idea what that is? By a show of hands? OK. Not nearly as many people who have used a robot. And that doesn't surprise me at all. That's, that's probably how it should be. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how our uh, cobots are different. We'll talk about really kind of the rules about how you can actually put a, a collaborative robot into uh, service. Uh, and then. Uh, well, unfortunately, that last line, as Darren uh, pointed out, we're not going to end up having time with the robot, unfortunately. Uh, that's actually a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever, I, I've been in robotics for a long time, and uh, I spent the majority of my career trying not to get hit by a robot. Um, so now I spend a lot of time bumping into the robot just to show people that it's OK. So um, first thing I would tell you is, uh, so uh, if, I, I think that it's important for you to understand the background of the people who founded our company. I've been at robotics for a long time. Uh, the two founders of our company, uh, Brian Carlisle and Bruce Shimano, have uh, been in the, uh-oh. <laughs> so uh, they've both been in the robotics industry for decades. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a picture of uh, Brian Carlisle with one of the first robots 
uh, called a Unimate. Uh, in fact, this was a project, uh, you might be familiar with the idea that people are now putting robots on top of mobile platforms to work inside of a factory. Uh, back in 1981, uh, Brian and Bruce worked out a, a way of actually putting a robot on a mobile platform very akin to what's happening today, albeit uh, maybe a little bit more expensive and a bit heavier. Um, but I, I really the whole point of telling you about who our founders are is that uh, they've been innovating and they've been making new technology in the robotics industry for a long time. So it's a lot of fun to work for them. They are always coming up with something new and different. Um, in fact, uh, just as a little bit more of an education, uh, this gentleman right here, uh, his name's Joe Engelberger. Um, they both worked for Joe Engelberger back when they were doing this project to make a, a robot. In fact, this Puma robot made by Unimation, this is a picture of them at the Smithsonian. It was actually being put into the Smithsonian as a part of the history of robotics. So um, I, I like to kid them and tell them that uh, they've been around long enough that they're now historical. Um, <laughs> and they don't usually laugh, but uh, anyway, Joe, Joe was the, considered the father of robotics, and that's why there's an Engelberg Engelberger Award named after him by the Robotic Industry Association. So uh, our company is relatively small. Uh, we try and outsource as much as possible. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the team's been together for an lo awful long time, but when I say that we're a lean company, we, uh, we outsource everything that we possibly can. We contract manufacture the robots. Um, however, we don't contract manufacture them outside the U.S. We actually make them in all places. Uh, sounds crazy, but we do actually build our robots in California, uh, in Southern California. Um, our electronics are actually made in Northern California, so we, we marry them together, and uh, that's what makes the product that you'll see later in videos. Um, we've actually been profitable and cash flow positive for seven years now, um, and we're always, you know, the, with these two, you can't possibly do anything other than continuously innovate and introduce new, uh, new products. So. Uh, now to start on the educational piece. So this is a graph of robot cost versus labor. If you can reduce the cost of a robot to an hourly uh, value, um, you get these two lines. The red line is uh, the cost of a large robot. The blue solid line is the cost for a small robot. And then of course you can see here by the it may be difficult to read, so I'll just uh, point out that uh, you've got the U.S. right here. You've got Germany with very high costs of labor, and then you have China with relatively low cost of labor. Um, I know because I lived through it that back in the early 2000s, we had a huge crash in the robotics industry because virtually every small widget, cell phones or pagers or anything else, really got shipped off to Asia to be made by hand. Um, and that was because their labor was really cheap. Um, now, if you track that over time, uh, you can see that now, uh, these days, uh, Chinese labor is actually more expensive than buying a robot. And because of that, it's no surprise that what you see in this graph is relatively flat growth for the Asia-Australia region until you end up with that uh, crossing over point and once the labor became more expensive, even if you do have two billion people that you really need to employ some way, you're gonna use robots if you have to because you have to stay competitive. And so you can see that in, uh, in Asia, and predominantly China, they have been automating and building in robots to their manufacturing at a breakneck pace. Um, now, you can take a look at uh, you know, how, a, how Europe has been doing, that's in the red. Uh, you can see how the U.S. has been doing. And the good news is, is that after the small uh, hiccup, let's say, that we had in 2008, 2009, there's been a steadily increasing uh, installation of uh, robots worldwide. Now, <clears throat> the forecast is that this next year is going to be relatively flat. Uh, that means that there won't be much growth. However, uh, starting in 2020 all the way to 2025, all of the analysts and prognosticators say that uh, there's going to be double-digit growth in the robotics industry. So uh, in terms of manufacturing growth, uh, even in North America, we expect to see growth. If you look at this graph, uh, you can see that, you know, in all fairness, uh, the U.S. or uh, North America, I should uh, add in North America, 
uh, you can see here that uh, it's relatively small compared to what's happening in Asia, um, but it's still growing. And in fact, there's some hope that it may grow even more. Um, and the reason for that is that, uh, well, quite frankly, uh, cobots are going to be growing very fast, supposedly. And cobots are typically used in a, uh, in a manufacturing environment where there are lots of rules and regulations that are going to govern how people interact with your automation. And some of you may have seen some of those videos of, uh, uh, you know, say a, a progressive dye tool in uh, a machine in China where there are people inside the tool and they're going down and, you know, making the, the exchange, right? Obviously, that doesn't ever happen here in the U.S., doesn't happen in North America or Europe. Um, so our, our hope is that uh, the collaborative robot business, or cobots as we like to call them, will be growing fast. And this, this happens to be, uh, you know, what, what this particular group, the Insight Partners, say is going to happen. Um, and their numbers are, at least they start off, roughly correct. If you look at, uh, you know, Collaborative robots, Now, and, and I'd like to show this graph uh, mainly because uh, when everybody held up their hands and said, oh yeah, I've used a robot or been around a robot, they're, just about everybody in the room put up their hands. And then when I asked about cobots, I think there were maybe two people. And that really underscores where uh, collaborative robots are right now in the market, which is they're slowly gaining acceptance and there's an awful lot of education that still needs to take place so that people understand what it really is. Um, so. What we hope, though, that you know, collaborative robots are based uh, generally on the idea of uh, being able to move around small payloads that people would move around and you know, really taking care of dull, dirty, boring, or even dangerous jobs. Um, and with that hope, there's you know, some uh, return, actually, of uh, manufacturing to North America, a fair bit into Mexico, uh, but some of it's even being reshored into the U.S. and Canada, um, and that's that's promising. Yeah. We never define collaborative robots, so how do I know what I use? Them? Well, uh, in another couple slides. Okay, I'm wait. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna that if you'd waited just a little bit more, I could have given you a nice fat twenty for uh, being a straight man. So. Um, so collaborative robots basically are robots that can be used, installed easily, but can be used without safety fences or any really, you know, whether it's a, uh, you know, extrusion and polycarbonate or if it's some sort of uh, electronic means, uh, collaborative robots are meant to be working around people. Um, they, you know, there, there's a, a number of things that supposedly they can do. Uh, it lowers the cost of uh, uh, applying the robot uh, and that's because you can just roll it up to something and make that work. Uh, it supposedly increases the f uh, flexibility because you can roll it around. Industrial robots, once you have them fixed in place, you know, they're generally big, sturdy mechanisms that are you know, relatively heavy and stiff, uh, not the kind of thing that you'd roll around the factory. Um, and then uh, you know, the idea here is, is that as robotics become more and more prevalent in our factories and as they become less guarded, then more people will be able to you know, work around the robots and become more comfortable with them. I'm not sure that's really that important. Uh, my own personal opinion is, is that making people more comfortable with robots is probably a bad idea. Um, you always have to be you know, mindful of what's going on. So to answer your question, what is a collaborative robot? Uh, there, there are some people uh, in the industry who uh, think taking a, a big uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to turn off my sound here, hopefully. Turn it down, there we go, all right. So a collaborative robot uh, you know, could be a big, dangerous industrial robot like what you see up in the corner here. And if you put an electronic fence, sensor system around it, that can qualify as a collaborative robot. In fact, what you're seeing here in the video is actually a, a very large Kawasaki robot uh, six-axis version that is uh, collaborative from the sense that it can go pick something up with someone outside of the fencing and then when the operator pushes the button the robot goes into a collaborative mode and the operator can actually go in grab a joystick and actually move the robot around so this actually qualifies as collaborative the human and the robot are actually working in tandem um, now this is a little bit more complicated 
in terms of how to make this work and make it work right. Um, we tend to, uh, our, our philosophy is a little bit different. Um, if you uh, take a look at uh, the, the videos here, uh, they're a little bit more instructive in terms of how that works. Yeah? One of the people here asked the question, how would you define the difference between a robot and an automatic machine such as a CNC mill? Yeah, so um, the CNC mill is going to work on, a, on a, uh, a part or a piece, and it moves around and works on a static part, whereas the, the robot uh, in, in general is not only a moving piece, but it moves the work piece around as well. Um, and that's generally how we look at uh, a piece of robotics. Um, so I, you know, it's a, a valid question. In fact, many of the same controllers that uh, work on a CNC, uh, they have a lot of the same theory behind them that actually drive a, a robot. Okay? So, uh, how many of you are familiar with the International Standards Organization? Everybody raise your hand. Thank goodness. Okay. All right. So, there is a standard, uh, which is ISO 10218. That's the machine directive. So if you build a piece of automated machinery, you need to go through that standard and make sure that your piece of machinery actually uh, complies with the machine directive so that you're, you're safe electrically and mechanically uh, and that uh, you follow basically the, the rules of making safe equipment. Now, as an additive, uh, as an addendum to that machine standard, uh, the ISO committee decided to add 15066. And 15066 is the industry standard for collaborative robots. And if you're, uh, if you're an insomniac, feel free to go find it and read it. It's great, uh, great uh, uh, treatment for uh, insomnia. Uh, let me just uh, get this video started again. I'm sorry? Honestly, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. Is programming part of that standard? Programming is not part of the standard. Uh, it's more. The in fact, I'll I'll talk more about that. So um, if you if you take a look at the videos and what's going on here, the standard really talks about uh, you know what is it that makes a robot uh, collaborative versus say an industrial robot. Now, this robot that you see here, the yellow robot, uh, it's made by a company called Fanuc. And uh, in this particular example, you can see that the gentleman who's getting close to the robot, when, he, uh, when he's away from the robot, the robot can move relatively fast. And then as he gets uh, closer and closer, the robot will slow down. And eventually, it'll stop when he gets close enough. Now, the way that they're implementing this technology is this is a big industrial robot capable of really injuring somebody pretty badly. Um, but the, the standard, uh, the section 5.5.1, uh, says that that's actually OK as a collaborative robot as long as you put some sort of sensing system in that allows the kind of operation that you see here. And you can see he's going to test it here in just a second. He's going to sprint at the robot. And you can see that the robot stops. So that's the idea behind making a dangerous robot collaborative, right? I'm not sure if I'd really volunteer to do that, but um, you know, I, it's supposed to have uh, you know redundant points of failure and all that. So uh, you're you're supposed to be able to do this without you know getting hurt. Now our philosophy is, and and we really adhere to and comply with the rules of 5.5.4, which is effectively. Uh, power and force limiting the robot. So as you can see in the video here, and this is what, our, what we had hoped to bring is this robot. Um, that robot uh, is you know, only capable of producing a, a small amount of force. Um, you, you can see that it can be you know, stopped with a finger. You can put your hands in between the inner and outer link as it's coming together, and it's not going to slice your fingers off. Um, so the idea behind that uh, is that you define force uh, effectively to say, okay, well, how much force can I generate with the robot before you know it's going to hurt someone? Now, as you can see, our friendly dog here is uh, actually demonstrating what collaborative really means. Uh, the the whole idea here is is that it exerts a certain amount of force and then says, okay, I'm not going to keep going because I might hurt someone. Um, now, so you had that on your garage door. 
Yeah, exactly. And so how many people can think of, so Roger got one, garage door. We're, the, we've got collaborative technology all around us all the time. So well, what are some others? Elevator doors and modern doors. Elevator doors, subway doors. Yep. It's all over the place. How about the car window, right? I know when I was a kid, you roll up the car window, it didn't stop. That hurt. <clears throat> But now your kid can put the, you know, your, their hand into the window, roll it up, and guess what? It goes back down. And that's all part of the technology. Um, and that's effectively the idea, albeit a fair bit uh, more complicated, behind the idea of being a collaborative robot. You're essentially finding some way of understanding either by proxy in terms of sensors or by directly looking at torque driven on the motors, how much force you're actually generating. Question from my history and experience, the elephant in the room is, how does OSHA view this? <laughs> so um, the, the way that works out, you can make a, a robot collaborative, but if you put a scalpel on the end of the robot, that's no longer collaborative, right? Or if you put something that is sharp next to a collaborative robot, that's no longer collaborative. But uh, this is essentially the way it gets tested is, each one of these kinds of collaborative robots, when they get put into service, have to go through something called a risk assessment, which is also part of the 10 to 18 standard, um, so that when you actually put the robot in place, you've, you've effectively gone through the checklist of, is it safe or not? Do they still have to apply lock and tag when they do servicing on this? No. Ooh. Right, and that's, all, and that's all based on the fact that it doesn't generate enough force to send you to the hospital. It might smart a bit, uh, if you were to get, you know, poked in the face or, you know, you have to wear safety glasses. Um, you know, if you've got your pinky caught in, uh, you know, a, a small pinch point, it might smart, but it's not going to cut you. It's not going to slice any pieces and parts of you off, and it's not going to send you to the hospital. Yep. Um, other than the, the ISO, is, is the ANSI working on any standards? Given the playing field. So honestly, I'm not sure. I would assume, well, I, the two generally work together. Um, and I do believe there are ANSI, in fact, I know for a fact in our manual, we've got certain ANSI standards, electrical standards that we have to adhere to, but those are generally also part of the machine directive. Um, so in terms of collaborative robots, I don't, I don't think ANSI has necessarily responded to that yet. I've had a project of doing a risk assessment through ANSI uh, B11.1. Mm -hmm. Ten to eighteen. Ah, okay. Which is the European Directive on Machine Hazard Assessment. Uh huh. Um, but there's also the NCB 1119, which pertains to robots in particular. Uh huh. I'm not familiar with this, but it's known it exists. Yeah, whether or not that that particular uh, ANSI standard actually applies to collaborative robots in addition to industrial robots, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm going to certainly go find out. Um, for sure, I know that if you do a risk assessment based on the 15066 standard, um, you can get that past uh, CSA, CE, uh, and you know, any third party you know, uh, standards uh, evaluating company like TUV or someone like that. Uh, if, if you had someone who was going to look at your robot and see if it was actually uh, collaborative, okay? So after torturing a bunch of grad students and probably paying them with a bunch of beers, they figured out just exactly how much force you could have uh, from the perspective of uh, you know, making contact with a person. Now, what's interesting about that is that there's really two ways of doing this. Uh, you can either hit them in free space or you can you know, trap them between a, a rigid surface. So quasi-static contact or transient contact really just talks about, did I trap someone or did I run into them in free space? And the difference there in terms of the type of collision you're making um, really comes down to uh, co compliance. So uh, if, if you look at it from the perspective of in free space, uh, you know, the robot running into something, you know, you've got an awful lot of compliance in the person, right? You just can't hold it stiff enough. Whereas if you were to mount it uh, in such a way that it was fixed, then obviously you're going to have instantaneous deceleration and therefore much more force, right? And that's, that's essentially what this whole thing is uh, built off of is, uh, you know, the types of collisions that you're going to have and whether or not there's very much compliance in the system. Now, to explain a little bit about that compliance, 
Um, this little box right here is actually a couple of plates with some springs. And what we did is we looked at the standard and we looked at, okay, how fast can we go? How much weight can we have? And then what part of the body is most likely going to get hit by the robot? Now, if you think like we do, the most likely thing that's going to get put in near a robot is going to be our hands, right? Not very many people stick their heads into you know, robots or their elbows or whatever. It's, it's usually your hands. And so what we did is we looked at the specification, and the specification says that if you, if you read through uh, you know, hand and finger, sorry, it's very difficult to read. I'll just read it off for you here. There's a compression constant. And the compression constant uh, basically says that uh, you have 75 newtons of force per millimeter that you can compress the hand with until you start to create real pain or uh, you cut can create damage, maybe break something, cut open the skin, that sort of thing. And so for the purposes of our testing, that's effectively what we've chosen. Now, if you know for sure that you're going to be getting some other body part in the way or trapped, then you can certainly you know, change your testing. But the, the point is, is that when you're in a trapped situation and you get hit, you, as, it, as it's, you can see in the video here, you really don't want to hit the hand with any more than 150 newtons of force. Otherwise, you violate, you're not in compliance with the 15066 standard. And that's really the whole idea. There are tables and tables and tables that are in the standard that go through every body part. And when I say they tortured a lot of you know, grad students, they had to collect a lot of data. They had to poke them in the arm. They had to poke them in the leg. They had to poke them in the keister. So there's all sorts of you know, tests that they had to do to go figure this out. And there are tables upon tables that will tell you just how much you could poke somebody at, you know, at a particular body part. But um, in this case, as I said, we chose the hand because we thought that was the most likely thing to get stuck into a machine. Um, but we, and, and with that said, we, we comply. Uh, even at full speed, with full power, we, we comply with uh, staying under 150 newtons. Why is that, why is that a linear measurement, not a square measurement? The force per millimeter, shouldn't it be millimeter squared? It's an area that you're applying a force to. Or is it the deflection? I think it's actually the compression that you're looking at, right? You're looking at a compression so constant. That you the so, so you're absolutely right, though. Uh, if, as an example, we're hitting on a fairly broad surface with a fairly broad surface, right. so that is part of the. That is so. If you take a look at the compression constant, there is. I guess it's not in this table, but there is an area requirement, right? If you if you change from this compression to this compression. Right but you're applying the same amount of force, then obviously you're going to end up. Right, exactly. And why they specify it uh, as, sorry, and why they specify it in uh, newtons per millimeter, I don't know. You're probably right. It should be millimeter squared. Yeah. Nope, now we're stuck. There we go. So. <laughs> it's, it is the ISO organization, sorry. <laughs> Europeans really love their metric measurements. <laughs> so um, the collision data that we've collected, uh, effectively what we've done is we've gone through the process of you know, figuring out uh, at what speed and then during what motion, uh, you know, what kind of force do we generate. And so really that's what this table uh, you know, shows you. Um, and it's been verified by TUV. Uh, you can see that uh, in manual control mode, when you're moving really slow with a pendant, no problem. You can see that free space collisions, it, you know, you're, you're so compliant, you never really get much force generated. You can go really fast as long as you know you're not going to have anything to get trapped against. Um, and so then rigid surface uh, collisions are really the one that you have to look out for, whether you're going to be you know, coming down to pick something up. You'll, you always want to make, it's always a good, uh, habit to be in. It's uh, probably uh, uh, important enough that you uh, slow down when you're going to go pick something up. When you're going away or if you're just running around out in free space, no problem. Um, but the idea here is, is that uh, you know, we're one of the few companies that's actually gone through and, and bothered with that testing. Um, Uh 
Uh huh. That would be a big deal. But um, if you take a look at how much 150 newtons of force is, um, you're talking about something about 20 pounds, uh, you know, uh, of a push. I, I, I make it akin to being pushed by a three-year-old that's not kicking and screaming. It's, it's really not that much force. So it would be unusual, although absolutely that could be part of your risk assessment to look at, okay, do you want to have people walking by and you know, how unsafe would it be? Right, it's, it's an attentiveness issue. They're, uh -huh. they're not aware of the position. Sure. Agreed. Um, uh, I, would, I would have to say that nine times out of ten, more like 99 out of 100, typically you'll see the robot is going to be mounted on a surface and in, inside of its work envelope, um, there's some sort of surface that it's going to be working off of. So, you know, really people walking by is going to be unusual. Now, if you have a situation like uh, you have that big yellow robot that has sensors, that does qualify as collaborative, but then you have to you have to set those sensors up so that people can't walk by. Um, so I think if it, if it's a free space collision um, with at least power and force limiting, there's a, a number of things that are going to mitigate having uh, someone getting hit and having them fall down. Um, but still, something that you'd have to cover in the risk assessment and be able to uh, you know apply. So uh, just saying that your robot is collaborative isn't enough. Now, I've, I've talked about a risk assessment, and that's, that's part of what I, you know, what I want to be able to talk about is um, you got to talk about the payload, right? So force equals mass times acceleration, right? So you can have a collaborative robot that handles, you know, 70 pounds, but that robot's going to have to go really, really, really slow. Um, whereas uh, if you look at in, in terms of, you know, doing human scale operations and doing them quickly, then really you're not going to have a really large robot carrying around a big uh, payload. What you're going to have is a small robot carrying around a relatively slow payload, small payload, and going relatively fast. Human scale, as we like to call it. Uh, meter per second, meter and a half per second. Um, by the way, I, I would mention there was a, a General Motors study done back in the 80s that showed that even back then, almost 80% of a car uh, was a kilogram or less, 2.2 pounds or less. Um, I would imagine that's become even more so these days because, as we all know, our cars are getting lighter and cheaper and there's a lot more electronics. Um, so uh, one of the things that you really want to look at in terms of the differences between, say, uh, uh, an industrial robot and the types of robots that we, we do uh, is, uh, in this instance, uh, a, 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 an industrial robot has what are you know some sort of gearing right it has a fairly high ratio gear train maybe 80 to 1 100 to 1 and if you look at uh, the types of robots that we make uh, we generally use very low gear ratios 3 to 1 5 to 1 and so what that really means there's a couple different ways to look at this with a large gear ratio you can effectively take the uh, gear ratio and the motor inertia and then, sorry, the gear ratio and the motor inertia, and then you multiply that times the inertia so that you end up with a, an effective mass out here in terms of your moment. Um, and what you can see is there's a huge difference between, say, having a 5 to 1 gear ratio or a, a, six, you know, a 5 to 1 or a 60, 160 to 1 gear ratio. It's essentially all the same motor, relatively similar masses in terms of uh, the parts of the robot, but what's happening here is, is that you get that uh, you know, mass of inertia and the, and the mass because you have that gear reduction. There's another way to look at it. Um, as a controls engineer, I look at it from the perspective of how easy is it for me to see any protobation in the system. So generally, when you're talking about seeing a knock or seeing some sort of contact, um, you know, the, the reflected inertia that you get back uh, you can see that there's uh, basically the, <laughs> the, the difference is that you have almost a, a square of your uh, gear ratio in terms of how much you see back in terms of reflective inertia, which means the more gear ratio I have, the less signal to noise ratio I have, right? You, you end up having a bump and you really can't see it because it can't make its way through the gear train. So there's a couple of different things, a couple of different ways to look at that. 
And that's, that's effectively, and sorry, I talked through my, my next slide, which is what it means is, is that you don't have nearly as much time to stop. So if you look at the difference between high gear ratios and low gear ratios, effectively the distance that you have to stop is very small with low gear ratios, and it's very large because you have so much inertia and, and effective mass behind it. And that's really the key behind making a low force, power limited uh, collaborative robot. And that's really what we do that's very different. Most other, uh, most other collaborative robots have been converted from being an industrial robot, or they're designed very similarly to industrial robots, and they are uh, effectively generating a lot of force. And what that means is they have to go fairly slow if you're going to have people walking around them without some sort of sensor. Um, that, back to that yellow robot with the scanner idea. A um, couple other things I'd like to point out. Uh, again, I just uh, you know, hopefully this is good, you know helping to help you think about it, and uh, hopefully you're learning something about how collaborative robots work. One of the other things that we like to uh, talk about is um, you know sharp edges are obviously not collaborative, right? Whether they're attached to the robot or whether they're just within the work envelope of the robot. So if you have a nest and the nest isn't rounded uh, or chamfered, then you have the possibility of cutting someone. And that's, that's obviously important. So you want to make sure that you're rounding your, uh, your nests. And you also want to make sure that you're going slow when you're going to go place into a position. Um, you also want to make sure that parts of your end effector, we make sure that the robot's relatively rounded, but if you put an end effector out there, like I said before, a, a scalpel on the end of the robot means that the robot's no longer uh, collaborative. You've just made it a very dangerous robot. So there's a, a whole bunch of things that you can do with robots. Um, for this slide, I usually like to tell people that um, if it's dangerous, or uh, if, if you have to protect people from the process, that's definitely not a collaborative uh, type of application. So for example, uh, soldering. You've got a hot, uh, you know, uh, hot soldering iron and uh, you know, hot, hot uh, material around. That's not a collaborative application. Most of the collaborative ap applications are relatively simple. You want to be able to handle parts, whether you're loading a machine like a CNC, you, load the machine, unload the machine, uh, testers uh, for all sorts of different things, whether it's a leak tester or a PCB or uh, other types of electronics testers. Um, certainly things like there are people using um, collaborative robots for things like welding. Um, but in general, those systems have a scanner instead of letting people walk right up to the process, right? So. Um, we do make a number of different collaborative robots. Um, we're the only ones that actually make a Cartesian uh, collaborative robot. We make a SCARA collaborative robot, and then we do make a six-axis collaborative robot. Um, and just as a, unfortunately, I, I understand that you're not going to get to see it, but um, our chief uh, quality engineer here is going to show you how easy it is to stop one of those robots. So uh, that's, that's worth another look here. This is. Uh, this is this is this is Nina. She's uh, she's six. She was really you know dying to help out. So uh, luckily, her dad, who's the director of mechanical engineering, figured out that uh, you know she could help by stopping the robot. So uh, we we like to show this. The robot's actually moving at a meter and a half per second. So it's moving pretty fast. Um, and the fact that she can just reach out and stop it uh, is you know really part of the point here. Um, this is going to show you the precise flex uh, robot, which is the SCARA robot. You can stick your hands in it. You can push it around. Uh, stands for selectively compliant articulated robot arm. <laughs> yeah. So. SCARA is a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Selectively compliant just means that it stays in a horizontal plane and a, a Z plane, and it can't articulate, right? And, and an articulating robot uh, is like this next one. This is an articulating robot. so. Uh, it, it can go at things from all different angles. I'm sorry, I missed a question. Um, I guess I had a few, um, basically what powers these sensors um, in the robot? Um, well, um, so, yeah, so we do things a little differently. There are some, 
uh, companies that actually do uh, collaborative, uh, well, tell you what, um, let me answer that in a couple more slides, and I'll, I'll be really specific about how we do that and what's different. I uh, just have one more slide here to show you. Uh, this is, you know, this is somebody else showing how easy it is to stop the collaborative robot. Um, so there's a whole bunch. It's, a, it's like the Wild West. There are a lot of collaborative robots out on the market right now. Um, and to answer your question, there are a lot of different sensors that people use. Uh, some people use accelerometers. Some people use load cells. Uh, you know, some people even, uh, you know, use specific torque sensors on their motors. What we do is very different. Um, so what we do, uh, and you can see our little scare up here, is very different from the rest of these robots. One of the things that I like to point out is that um, many of these robots are really the product of, you know, uh, research, basic research done at a university. Um, so you've got some of them that, you know, are trying to look like, you know, Robbie the robot. Uh, and virtually all of them are what we would call an articulated six-axis robot. And so with that said, um, you know, some of them, like this KUKA robot, uh, have uh, just about every sensor you can think of built into them. And they're, they're fantastic. They are, you know, they're not actually, I, I, I think my, uh, my scabs are just about gone, but I actually, uh, I actually put my hand under one thinking, oh, yeah, they, these guys, they're... Uh, you know, German engineers, it's, it's going to work, you know, no problem. And it smushed me pretty good. Um, and then when I asked what happened there, you guys have load cells and you have accelerometers and you have all this stuff that's actually looking at it and said, ah, well, we, you know, for the purposes of the demonstration, we wanted to be able to move a little faster, so we turned it off. <laughs> fantastic. Well, that was fantastic to find out. <laughs> Luckily, it was. Uh, luckily, there was some compliance not only in my hand but in the nest that they were putting it in. So, you would have thought, right? Yeah. So, and and that goes back to my comment. This is kind of like the Wild West. There's a lot of different technologies going into this. And, you know, to be honest with you, um, KUKA uh, in this picture is really just about the only. Oh, ABB and KUKA. Uh, out of all of these pictures are really the only ones other than ourselves who have an industrial robot background. Um, and so what we do is very different. So the sensors that we use are the absolute encoders that are in the arm, and we use current sense resistors. So the current sense resistors are essentially a proxy on torque. How much power are we driving into that motor tells us how hard it's going to be able to turn. And then the absolute encoders tell us effectively, you know, backing, backtracking through the kinematics, it tells us where we're going or where we can go. Now, what we do that's different is we use a, an algorithm called dynamic feed forward. Now, if you've ever tuned a PID loop um, for control, you know that your proportional integral and derivative gain, you, you, that's kind of just your basic stuff. And then you can add in things like acceleration feed forward or friction feed forward. Dynamic feed forward actually goes a step beyond that. Um, dynamic feed forward is effectively the equations that are uh, that represent that robot, both for statics and dynamics. So you've got your CGs, you've got your masses, and then you have all these equations, all the differential equations that represent how that robot's going to get, you know basically run. And then we we run that. We basically try and substitute and reduce that set of equations so much that we can actually run the algorithm in real time that is going to predict how much uh, current we have to drive the robot with and where it should be so that we can react very, very quickly. So that's why Nina can reach out and stop the robot very quickly because we've got this really high-end processor that's built into the robot that's looking at those two sensors, if you will. Those are, those are just kind of standard things that people build into their controls and into the robots, but we convert them into essentially our own sensors of the robot. Well, so we actually set, we set values on that in the firmware so that the robot will never, ever perform in any other way other than being power and force limited to be collaborative. So it, we, don't ever, we, we don't allow people ever to get in there and be able to set it so that it could be unsafe. Yeah. You can't turn it off like the other guy did. You can't turn it off, period. Right. I know that for a fact. <laughs> yeah. Do you have to calibrate each machine? Each time you started, or nope. We uh, so we use a belt and pulley system, and we actually custom hob our pulleys, and we get special uh, belts. 
so that uh, there's very little variation in terms of we, 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 uh, we go to Hayden Kirk, if you're familiar with them as a bearing manufacturer, and we have some very tight tolerances that we hold on everything from friction to fit um, in terms of how things go together. So there's every one of these will work on the same set of calibration files, if you will. Um, there's a range, of course. Um, and that's why our, our uh, repeatabilities, for example, there are some of them that will be repeatable to 60 microns, some that will be repeatable to 75, and some that will be repeatable to 90. And that's why we say we're repeatable to 100 microns. But there is some, there's some variation, but we take care of that. It's within our uh, best way to put it is it's within the performance band that we allow. It's actually controlled by the friction within the machine. I'm sorry? It's actually controlled by the friction in the machine, is it not? Um, because if you anticipate any additional force encounters, it's got to stop. Right. So unexpected forces don't stop. We absolutely. So we account for friction in the system. That's okay. that's you correct. Have a, have a time tolerance is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. So now now it sounds like if somebody installs this in a dusty environment, you might find that it slows down automatically just because there's additional friction. Um, potentially, if we didn't protect our, our bearings, that might happen. Yeah, but we, we protect our bearings from getting stuff in there. Do you use a volumetric sensing, let's say like a LIDAR, so you're detecting position and velocity of a person or whatever coming at you so that you can anticipate when the collision will occur and you can stop with that? So there are a number of collaborative robots that do exactly what you just said. LiDAR is very popular, but those are generally for robots that are much larger. Like that, that yellow robot that's a big, dangerous industrial robot, that's how you can turn that robot into a collaborative robot is by putting a LiDAR sensor on there. And that's exactly what was happening in that video when the, when the person was, you know, that gentleman was, you know, kind of walking closer and closer or even ran at it. That's what's going on there. Um, our robots, we don't do that because we ensure that it can't ever generate enough force to, uh, to, to violate the regulations of how much force you can actually you know, hit someone with. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, that's okay. This is all good stuff. <laughs> I, that's not an unusual question. Um, so I happen to, uh, I'm a California native. I happen to live in the Bay Area. We have some, uh, we have unfortunately some lawmakers who believe that, you know, robots are going to take so many jobs that uh, they need to tax them just like their workers. Um, I, I think there's, there's, a ton of uh, information and there's lots of studies that have been done that show that rather than somebody having to do a boring repetitive job, what ends up happening is you raise the workforce and they start doing value added types of activities. Um, but I do understand that there's, you know, there's fear about, okay, what's going to happen to those people? The, the answer is unfortunately there will probably be some left behind. Uh, I, I would hold up two examples. The people who used to make buggy whips, uh, you know, obviously uh, Ford put them out of business, right? Or even a better example, because um, it happened during my uh, career. Uh, when I first started working, uh, if I ever traveled, I had to call who? American Express. And American Express would set up my travel. I don't do that now. I get on the internet and I go, I go shopping, <laughs> right? Uh, so travel agents, the secretarial pool, Anybody, you know, administrative staff, you know, they've, that, that whole area has shrunk. So th there's really two answers. One is this is a very technical kind of uh, uh, product that has to be applied. So there have to be mechanics, there have to be technicians. So hopefully what happens is there are some people who are going to raise their level of contribution from just mindlessly putting something in and out to I'm turning a wrench or I'm, you know, doing something to improve the robot. But I, I, I won't stand here and tell you that we aren't going to necessarily take people's jobs. I, we're working on projects now in the food industry that are going to put, you know, 15, you know in California, our, uh, our uh, minimum wage is $15 now. 
Uh, I can tell you that there's tons. Uh, everybody from you know, your local uh, you know, round table pizza to McDonald's, they're all looking for ways to reduce their uh, labor. Um, and so that's, that's all going to be happening. So fairly soon, unfortunately, you're going to find that people are going to have to either educate or find something else to do. Or 15 equals zero. Yes, you got it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, but that's what's called disruptive, uh, disruptive industry. Mm -hmm. That that's part of progress, but progress. you can get a million different products. I agree. Took a, not too many yep. typewriter repairmen around. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Literally. I actually took typing in high school. <laughs> Blacksmiths. Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. Can I inter interject a thirty-second levity issue, which was kind of a side note to this, a little humorous anecdote, if you don't mind. A couple of years ago, I bought a foreign-made automobile, and it comes with all kinds of wonderful bells, whistles, as you all know. Well, the dealership had a class to teach the owners all the new wonderful safety features that came from this vehicle. And they got around to the subject of the automatic braking system. Anybody have one of those? Currently? So they explained how it worked. And this individual said, well, I don't have that in my car. He said, well, what do you have? And you mentioned the model of the vehicle. He said, well, it doesn't come in that vehicle. It comes with a higher-end vehicle. Yours does not happen to have that. And I said, well, mine does. He said, well, what do you drive? I said, the same vehicle as this gentleman just mentioned. He said, well, that's impossible. I said, no, it's not. She sits next to me and she yells, stop! <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see where that now, was going. I, I worked at OSHA for a thousand years. And let me tell you, what can go wrong, goes wrong. Yeah, so whether right. they like it or you like it, you win. You're yeah. still there. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you have to do a whole risk assessment. Yep. Exactly. It's like machine will take over human. I'm sorry? Machine will take over human. Eventually. Yeah, there are all sorts of things, including uh, artificial intelligence, which is now starting to take over decision making. And they're starting to couple. Uh, so I, since, since we started in the industry, I'm sure Darren and I have both seen the addition of cameras that have become eyes. Uh, we've seen uh, all sorts of different sensing technologies be added to robots. And now with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you, you know, robots are going to start making decisions, not people. Do your robots interface with cameras and Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you can find the mushrooms coming down the line. Sure. Put yeah. Them in the we do vision guided conveyor tracking now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. What is one of these going to come around and serve us drinks? And There's a company in uh, Silicon Valley called Bear Robotics. They're already working on it. Yep. Yeah. They have Amazon has the one that steps Keep out it. of the back of the truck right. and right. Yeah. yeah. No, there's there's all sorts of uh, robots that are starting to do everything. Like I said, everything from food delivery to you know <clears throat> making food to uh, you know delivering it. Uh, it's all already oh, been happening. Wow. Did you have a question? Yeah, just uh, I should have asked this earlier, but um, on your chart, <clears throat> on your chart where you're saying uh, until 2025, I believe, or 22. We're seeing almost double-digit growth. Uh, That's what the analysts are saying. Any, uh, any reasoning why that high? Or what, is there, Ab absolutely. I, mean, price I believe the need is going to be there, but at the same time, I don't, I don't really see anything that is going to support that need yet. You know, like what, what have you seen as um, industry leader sure. uh, that, that would support that, that need? So there's a couple of applications that I've seen that are, I think, going to drive a, a whole bunch of growth. Um, one is um, putting these types of robots, a force-limited robot can be put on a mobile platform, and that can move around your factory and you know, move, move material for you. It can do operations that people would do, and, they're, and that's happening. Uh, we already are working in applications like that. Our factory has those. Yeah, OK. So that's, that's already happening. Um, also, uh, everything from, well, I, I would just call it delivery kiosks. So everything from ice cream to food to, I mean, you name it. In fact, even today, uh, uh, if the, uh, Darren and I were at the uh, Canadian Manufacturing Technology Show in Toronto uh, two weeks ago, and if you walked up to the Pepsi uh, vending machine and you popped in your code and you passed your, your credit card, uh, robot would actually go out and get it. Now, that was hidden behind, uh, you know, uh, effectively a, a guard, 
but that guard isn't there to keep you from getting in the way of the robot. It's to keep people from taking the stuff, right? <laughs> but the whole idea of kiosks that you know, deliver things to people uh, is prevalent in many, many different industries. The best buy electronics things in the airports now. Exactly, yeah. right. So you're almost saying it's, it's more or less because people's comforts, com comforts are increasing with robot, robots rather than... I think it's that as well as, uh, I, I think it's also the fact that uh, with $15 an hour you know, minimum wage, uh, let's face it, uh, big companies are trying to figure out a way to get rid of direct labor. Yep. Sorry, you had a question? I was curious about the halt in growth from, say, this year and the next. What was that reasoning that they said? That really depends on who you talk to. Uh, you know, there are people who say that there are political reasons, like trade, you know, uh, trade issues. There are other people who say that it's just a, it's just a hiccup because of in uncertainty. Uh, it happens to be an election year, and people are not sure, you know, what's going to happen. So. Uh, uh, the, the question was, why is there going to be a hiccup in 2019? Um, and uh, my own personal opinion is, is that it's a mix of, you know, it's never just one thing. Uh, there's a lot of things that play into it. And we've had a lot of growth. If you look at 2008 until 2018, those 10 years have been a lot of growth, a lot of, you know, a lot of equipment being put in place. So there's, I think there's going to be a natural uh, you know, amount of slowdown, but it's also coupled with you know, other things. Tariffs, yeah, uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen next. So um, you're standing up, which means I should probably stop. Uh, there's a there's a couple of things that I, I would like to uh, show. Uh, hopefully, this is going to play here. I wanted to show uh, a video. It doesn't look like it's going to play, unfortunately. No, it was not. Um, so this is uh, unfortunately does it play? Oh, was it okay? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Ah, OK, great. So this is actually a video of uh, one of the most prevalent uh, collaborative robots out there. Um, and this is me trying to stop that robot, um, trying pretty hard. And I'm not a small guy. Um, and it just pushed me right out of the way. So you've got to be really careful with collaborative robots. If you've got a force limited robot, you're probably OK. But as I found out, if it's not a force limited robot, you better make sure you check everything. That lockout tagout is probably not a bad idea, even with a you know, collaborative robot. Um, so I, in your industry, there is some branding with different colors. Yes. Yours, your designs are all, well, the, the Scara robot has a unique design look. Yes. Yeah. And, it, and everything we make is kind of medical white, people like to say. I don't know why they say that, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and Go to the, the very back here. I'm going to zip through all the, the videos and show you what a, a collaborative robot application looks like here. Uh, this will be my last slide. Hopefully the video will play yeah, here. It yeah, OK. Fine. It's just we not just playing here. OK, yeah. I see. OK, great. So what's happening here is we're using one of our SCARA robots. And it's picking up the little plastic pieces that are uh, coming out on a, uh, essentially a shaking table. There's a vision system. You can see the uh, image back there. Uh, the image system is looking at those parts and then telling the robot where to go pick them up. The robot picks them up, dips them in the liquid, then puts it into the plastic housing. It picks up the plastic housing, puts it into the press. Uh, after it picks up the part that was in there, and then once it's done putting the part in, it then decides good part, bad part. Really straightforward. This operation replaced two and a half people. There were three people who were doing this before. Now there's a half a person who's just making sure things are loaded, and you'll notice that there's no guarding. The press was the interesting piece here. Uh, the robot's certainly collaborative. The gripper that they made is, you know, certainly the, that robot's not moving fast enough to hurt anybody. You could even put your hand underneath it, and it's not going to crush you. Um, it, I'm sorry? It It'll go faster than this, sure. Um, in this particular instance, they didn't need to go any faster because of the process. But the interesting piece is what happens with the press. You can see that there's a little piece of uh, polycarbonate on the front of it, and that's their way. There's a, a sensor on it, and if you put your hand in there, uh, that lifts up and uh, makes the press stop, so you can't get your hand smushed. So they even made a press uh, collaborative, right, or, or safe, let's say, for people to be able to get their hands in. Would it be a hindrance if you have presence-sensing equipment, such as a, a skid mat or other types of mat, that if you stepped out 
or proximity sensor that would stop it? No, I, I wouldn't say it's a hindrance. I mean, that there's the, the whole idea behind this is to allow you to have an open manufacturing environment. So there's nothing there's nothing wrong with having uh, you know some sort of sensor, whether it's lidar or whether it's uh, you know some sort of pressure mat. Uh, just, just if, so you know, you can use that for that very purpose to slow down. Well, to prevent you from entering into that zone. Sure. But you cannot yeah. use it for working on the machinery itself. Right. In that case, you yeah. have to lock it out. Right. Okay. Yeah. So how, if you're saying it actually judged whether it was a good piece or not. I'm sorry. Did it actually judge whether? Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's after after it's done in the press. The press actually tells it whether or not it made a position, and if it made that position, then it's a good one. If it didn't make that position, it's done, and uh, it's a bad part. So Roger standing again. That's the second time. I can feel it. So thanks so much for listening. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. As a token of appreciation. Oh, wow. Oh, awesome. A, a souvenir mug. Thank you very much. All right. Much. All right. Fantastic. Our next meeting. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this recorded presentation given at one of the Atlanta Metro Chapter meetings of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. To find out more about us or to join us, check us out at gspe.org.